cowboy style of life is just different from, you know, living in a big city and having a suit and tie and, and uh, you know, we're all about Jesus here, but we wear our cowboy hats and our boots. And we have a heart for the youth and college here in Weatherford. We do buckouts and bull rides and team ropings and calf ropings and anything to do with arena events. We have a ride every uh, third Monday night of every month. And uh, tonight we're going to just buck some bulls. We're going to have a little word. Uh, the rule is you need to be here by 7 o'clock and then we can say Jesus paid your fees and, and you get to ride for free. It's just like heaven. If you don't accept Jesus, uh, before the gates close, then you don't get in, and it's the same thing. We're going to look at uh, Mark, the 10th chapter tonight. Then in the arena, it's simply, uh, it's time to just get real. It was a good rush. Get on the next one. We spend time with the kids. We don't just uh, get here and disciple them and, t and preach at them. We work behind the bucket shoes with them. Other than that, uh, it's, it's church. Hey, it's good to have y'all. Welcome to Silverado Cowboy Church, where Jesus, King of the Cowboys, and everybody's welcome. The reason we say that is because we want you to know that God is no respecter of persons. And we are glad that you are here today. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, when we receive the word, it's Jesus called it the washing of the water of the word. Uh, Paul also later on talked about the washing of the water of the word. I want you to receive the word today and to be able to put it into your life and, and make use of it. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That rightly dividing the word of truth means where you apply it to your life. I want you to receive the word today, be able to apply it to your life, and remember that God loves you. I'll talk to you after this broadcast. Uh, take your Bibles and uh, I'm, uh, we're going to spend some time in Psalms this morning. Now, I'm going to move around just a little bit so I can see if I can get the wind out of my microphone. All right, I think I figured out how to do that. So I'm going to move my chair over, and then I'm going to turn a little bit and see if we can stay out of the wind. Um, in Psalm, and I, I want to start in... Uh, Psalm 150. Psalm 150 is uh, about praise. And realizing that in today's time, the most important thing that we can do is get in a position that we... Uh, we praise because when we praise, it empowers our faith towards God to get in a position that we realize that when we praise Him, we're actually talking about who He is. Sometimes when we talk about faith, uh, we talk about our faith. We talk about how our faith grows and how our faith is empowered. And the thing that we have to do is, in, in going to uh, Mark 11.22, and we've looked at that a lot of times, but in looking at it, we realize that what it does is it empowers our ability to be able to walk and to live in faith uh, the way that uh, his word says. 
And the thing remembering in Mark 11, 22, it says, have faith in God. The Moffat's translation says, have the faith of God. So here's what praise does for us. Praise gets us in the position that I don't look at my faith, I look at his faith. Amen. I look at the ability to be able to believe that God is who he says he is and who he says he will be. And is he that in your life? And that's what I want to look at because the thing we realize is it is our faith towards him uh, that causes us to walk in the fullness of what he wants us to walk into. When we walk in the fullness of what God wants, then we walk in the fullness of exactly where we want to be in our daily walk with him. And it doesn't matter what's going on. And Kathleen says, every time I say that I'm not going to spend any time here, I go ahead and spend time here. I don't want to talk about what's going on in the world today. Even though that's what's fresh on our mind and, and in our thoughts, and even has a bearing on how we're going to come back when we come back to church. So, when I, if I'm going to have the faith of God, then I'm going to have to praise Him in the position that I realize is going to change my attitude towards who I am today because of who He is in me. And if I do it in a fashion that I know who He is in me, then I'll do it in a fashion that'll change my life today. Psalm 150 says, praise the Lord. So right there where you're at, I want you to shout, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I even heard some of you. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. And when we look at firmament, it means the expanse of the heavens. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him for the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and with the dance. So anybody thought you weren't supposed to dance in church, you just went to the wrong church before. It's okay to dance in church. It's okay to dance before the Lord. It's okay to praise Him. Sometimes we get in a place that we continue to look back at where we've been, and it might have been a place that was a very conservative church, and there's nothing the matter with a conservative church because we have to remember that we want to honor God and we want to have a reverence towards God, but I want to praise Him and I want to use everything that he gave me. The Bible tells us David danced before the Lord with all his might. Why? Because he was happy. Because he was excited. You know, somebody got mad at him. It was his wife. His wife said, quit acting like you're so crazy. Quit acting like you're an idiot. And the fact was, David was just happy about the Lord. And he wanted to praise the Lord for who he was. In him. It goes on, it says, Praise him with, uh, with stringed instruments and with flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. You know, I go back and I think about the fact that, uh, hey, take your Bibles and turn over to uh, Psalm 24. Now, one of the Psalms we're skipping through, and, and we didn't uh, spend any time there, but it always stands out to me. Psalm 139, David talks about 
how important he is to God. And I want you to read it because I want you to realize you're important to God. You need to know that God cares about you in each and everything. Okay, Psalm 24. The heading there says the king of glory in his kingdom. The earth is the Lord in all of its fullness. The world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend onto the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. Now think about this. If the earth is the Lord's and all that's in it, do you think he knows what's going on right now? He does. Do you know that he has you in his hand in the position that I realize that it was God who paid for my health and for my healing. Which does not give you the privilege of not being careful to not get in a place that you're going to jeopardize your health. Now, in saying that, I don't live in fear. I'm not going to live in fear. If you've been here very long, you know that there's not any fear in me. I don't care. I don't believe that it can come near my house. But that doesn't mean that I go hug and shake hands with somebody who's got it and say, okay, well, I said I wasn't going to spend any time on it today. But you have to realize, if everything's God's, he gives me the ability to use the brain that he gave me between my ears. And if he gives me the ability to be able to do that, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what I need to do to stay in the position that I can continue to praise him because I don't have to think about where I've been and what I've done. You know, and that doesn't just count for... I haven't said it yet. I'm going to say it. That doesn't just sound, count for the coronavirus. That counts for everything in your life. Do you want God to bless you financially? Well, then honor him with your finances in your tithes and offerings, but also honor him in knowing that he's a supplier of everything that you need and everything that you desire and everything that you want. My clip fell off my, my microphone, so I'm trying to keep up with it so I don't lose it. All right, here we go. Verse 5. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from God, from the God of his salvation. Whoa. All the way in the Old Testament, David talked about salvation that we receive from the God of our salvation and the righteousness that we get in it and we realize that that carries over from the Old Testament even greater in the New Testament because when we make Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, we become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So again, he is the, his salvation is brings our righteousness and David talks about that here this is Jacob the generation of those who seek him who seek your face think about Jacob Jacob was the guy that he went out and, and first we know him as the deceiver because he deceived his father to get the birthright but then he goes out and he says he's touched in a, in a vision. He climbs a ladder into heaven. 
in his vision. And then he grabs on and he says, until you bless me, I will not let go. That's how God wants us to be towards him, is he wants us to be in a position that when we hang on to God, that we won't let go until we get what we want from him. Whether it's a blessing, whether it's, whether it's uh, uh, direction, whether it's the wisdom that we're looking for, whatever that wisdom might be, we hang on until we get it. And that's how I know Jacob. Jacob hung on and said, I won't let go until you bless me. Verse 7 says, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Think about that statement right there. Just that one little part. Who is the king of glory? The strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. The, do you know that whatever battle you're in, at any time, it's the Lord's battle, not mine, not yours. And when we depend on God and we realize that that battle has already been won because of what God has done in us, through us, and he's already done it once, he's going to do it again today, and he's going to do it again tomorrow. And what I have to realize, it's God's battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift up your you everlasting doors. As the king of glory shall come in. I look at that and I think, am I a door that God can come in anytime he wants to? Am I a door that I am open to him and everything that he does? Or do I get closed off and get going my way and think that my way might be the best? And the fact is, is when we stay open to what God is, we're always open to change in direction if we're going the wrong way. Who is the King of Glory? The Lord of Hosts. He is the King of Glory. Selah. Selah means let it be so. Same thing we would say, and Kathleen's got on the back side of her sign pointing at me right now, says amen. Same thing. Amen. That's the way I want it. I'm done. This is it. God is the king of glory. I want to go back to... Uh, Psalm 23. As we've looked at who we are in God and who God is in us. And if I'm going to have God be the one that rises up inside of me, then I've got to be the one that turns towards him and says to him, Father, I'll follow you anywhere you want me to go. I'll do it any way that you want me to do it. Kathleen and I had made a, a trek across the United States to get to Weatherford, Texas. Uh, the ministry uh, went to Colorado. Uh, 
uh, we stayed in Colorado for a season. At that time, we had uh, several churches in auction yards all across the United States, seven, seven churches going at once that met on uh, seven different nights. And, uh, and, and those were all in different states. Um, in that trek, he sent us to New Mexico. And when we got to New Mexico, we stayed there for a season. And when we went from Colorado to New Mexico, I said, Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. Just don't send me to Texas. And the reason was because we saw that there were a lot of ministries in Texas at that time. Well, God in all his wisdom says, you don't want to go, I'm going to show you where you're going. And when we came here, the Lord told me, he said, uh, no matter where else you go, you'll always be here. And so we moved the office and everything right here. Now, I shared all that because if God is the God of glory, and the next place we're going to go is to Psalm 23, if he's going to be the God of glory, then he's got to be my shepherd. And I've got to do what he wants to do, not what I want to do. Which doesn't mean he'll make you do things that you don't want to do, but it means that he, he'll do things <coughs> and as he does them we realize that he wants to see if we'll follow the thing I've noticed about sheep and I've talked about this before about when at the two different groups of sheep that we had. If, and if you look down at the barn, you find out we don't have any now. I did the happy dance when I sold them. But the thing that I learned is sheep will follow you because they know you're going to feed them. I mean, I live in no illusion that it's not because I look so good or smell so good, but it's because they know that I got the feed bucket. And that's what God wants to do for you. God wants to feed you. He wants to take care of you, and he wants to show you in every single way that you belong to him. I believe that God wants to flaunt you in front of the whole world and say this one belongs to me but in order for him to be able to do that so even though we know what Psalm 23 says and because we read Psalm 23 and we listen to Psalm 23 we have to remember that there's prerequisites to let God do everything in your life that he wants to do. That doesn't mean you can earn it. It's a free gift. It's the grace of God that gives us those things. But there are prerequisites to receiving it even though it's a free gift. The first thing I do, I've got to do what this first verse says. I've got to say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Hey, that's my statement of faith. I'm not going to want for anything. But it's my faith because of the God of glory 
that I depend on in every place, in everything that I do. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. Do you have a choice whether you lay down in that green pasture or not? Yeah. We have a choice. I've got to follow him and then do what he wants me to do. In order to do that, and I shared all that, I may have lost some of you whenever I said, I said, Lord, I don't want to come to Texas. And it had nothing to do with here. It had to do with what I thought I saw. But when God says go, and we follow, I love where I live, I want to live here, I'm glad God sent me here, but I had to do what he wanted to do. <coughs> what I have to remember is if I wanted to lay down in the green grass and have that water, I had to listen to where he took me in order to live in that abundance that he wanted me to have. And I believe those of us in the livestock world understand that Hey, if you don't want to feed hay, you got to have green grass. You got to have green pastures. I mean, green pastures to me, by the way, the reason that uh, grass isn't any taller around here is because I mowed it a couple of weeks ago, but it, you see it's already coming back. So I realized that yesterday I, I cut around. If you, I, if you didn't know this, it was supposed to be our first arena event today. Naturally, with everything going on, we didn't, we're not having it. But, if you drive by, you see that I mowed all around the arena. That's why I'm coughing today. I mowed there yesterday and actually finished at daylight this morning. Hey, I'm going to tell you, that grass was this high. We could have bailed it for hay. Choked the lawnmower down almost dark last night, so I had to just get off it and leave it. The reason I'm talking about that is because that's the lush pastures that I believe that God wants us to walk in, not the sparse-looking grass that we see here on this hill right now. But I'm talking about thick, matted together, make the best hay you could bale, because it's so thick. And that's the picture I get in my mind when I read this second verse that he makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside the still water. He restores my soul. Remember, it's your spirit that gets saved, not your soul. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. He restores your mind, will, and emotions he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He calms me down. He makes me know that I'm going to be okay, that everything is going to be okay. I'm married to a beautiful lady who says, this too shall pass. And that has to be our statement that we realize when negative things are going on, whatever it is, this too shall pass because God is on your side. God wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. He wants to be the one that gives you everything that you need every day of your life. Yea, though I walk through the shadow, valley of the shadow of the coronavirus. Oh, no, no. The shadow of death. 
I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and their staff, they comfort me. And I know I've shared this before, but the rod and the staff, even though they were connected, they were two different things. The staff wasn't made to walk with. It wasn't a cane. It was something to poke predators away from the sheep. When the enemy comes, I get this picture that God has taken that into that rod and he's poking him. Saying, get away from him, he's mine. That's the picture we need to have. Understanding that when he talks about the rod and the staff, the other end, the rod, the staff, was a hook that if the sheep fell in the water, there was a reason for going beside still waters, because fast waters, they go down. But if the sheep fell in the water, they can't get out because the wool's heavy, and they get wet down, and that hook would grab them and bring them back out. Used to, I used the hook at the arena to grab the feed bucket to pull it over by the door so I didn't have to go in and have the sheep all over the top of me or the ram button me. God wants, to not, wants you to know He cares about you. He is uh, on the job when the enemy has come towards you and he's on the job when you're in trouble and you need help. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. I was thinking about last night, I was uh, somebody posted on Facebook the other day that I saw, and I don't you know, look at Facebook very often, but uh, Pastor Kathleen showed me a comment that I won't say her name, but her initials are Tanya Yuri posted on there that uh, I would sure be glad when things got back to normal because of all the chores we've been doing. And I'll tell you what, we've got a lot of stuff done that I plan on doing for a long time. But I'm not going to kid anybody. I'm ready to be done for a while. The reason I shared that is because last night I sat down in the chair and Kathleen brought me a glass of tea. And it was filled to the top. But it didn't take very long until I only had about maybe an inch and a half left in it. And I looked at it, and then I said, Honey, I'd like a little more tea, please. Well, I look at this first, and that's what brought to my mind. Do you know with God, you don't have to look and see if the glass is half empty or half full? Because the God of our salvation gives us the cup or the glass that's overflowing. Brimming to the top. You don't drink a little bit use a little bit of what he's giving you and then look to see if it's going going away. It's not like the stimulus that they're giving us right now from the government. It's not going to go away. That'll go away, that stimulus will. But God's provision will never go away. 
He will always give us the provision that we need in all things. I think it's cool because I think another picture on this stimulus that's coming out is I heard somebody say, well, I'm not on unemployment. I don't need it. So what? You still get it. That's the God that we serve that gives us more than enough and it doesn't matter where it comes in the Bible says that God will cause men to give into our bosom and I just see that as another place that he's given into our in our, our lives that God's given us more of what we like to have by the way if you don't like money and you want to send it to me that's okay and I'm joking because I know every one of us says, hey, I can find something to use it for. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I think that verse sometimes we go through too fast. We go, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you really think about what goodness and mercy are? Mercy was something that God gave us when we needed it. Mercy is something that God gives us every day of our life. My friend Don, he says this, he says, every day God sprinkles a little bit of grace on us, and what we do with it determines the outcome of our day. That's mercy. That's grace. That's the goodness of God that he gives to us every day, whether we need it or not. We need it. You deal with things every day that we need to have the grace of God and the mercy that he's showed even Job. Hey, look at Job. Do you think he needed mercy halfway through the book? Did he need grace? What did he get? He got three times anything he had ever had. He got more than enough. That's the God that we serve. The God of more than enough. Whatever it is that we need. Grace, mercy, comfort. And we realize God cares about each and every one of us. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Where is the house of the Lord? Well, Jesus said, My Father and I will come and make our home inside of you. Paul says, know ye not that you are the temple of God. So, this is the house of God. And if I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, then I realize, not only am I going to dwell in my body, but I'm going to dwell in the presence of the God that lives in my body. And when I dwell in the presence of the God that lives in my body, then I know that I'm not going to lack for any good thing. I'm not going to lack for any wisdom that I need, any comfort that I need, any soundness of mind that I need, any health that I need. 
come into that place that I realize, oh yeah, David said this. First Samuel chapter 17. David said, the battle's not mine, it's the Lord's. He told his brother, he said, is there not a reason? I'm going to ask you, is there not a reason that we should depend more on God every single day? I'm not talking about right now. I'm talking about every single day for every need that we have in any way that we have it so that we can have the abundance of God in our life so that I can rest in soundness of mind and not have to worry about anything. And when I do that, then I know that if God be for me, who can be against me? Oh yeah, that's what the Bible says. But do you have that in your heart? Do we know that it's just what the Bible says, or do we know that it's a fact? I believe I'm talking to people that know that it's a fact. As I'm talking to people on, on the internet by television, do you know that God cares about you? God will watch over you. God will give you everything that you need. Sometimes I realize that, especially when I watch the constant negative news, and I'm not talking about any particular channel right now. Right now, it seems like you hear too much of what's going on and not enough of where we're going. I know where we're going. We're going... The Lord gave me a word in December. The Lord gave me a word that for givers, there would be supernatural increase all year. And that word wasn't based on the economy. That word was based on the God that controls everything in your life if you depend on Him. Nothing else. It wasn't because... The economy was so good, and it was. It still is. The God that we serve will cause us not to lack in any good thing. Just because he's the God of glory. Psalm 24 said, He is the Lord of glory. I want you to remember that throughout this week. That as we look at that, we realize that the God of glory has one plan in his life for you. One plan in his mind. One plan in his hand. And that's to succeed because he loves you. Amen. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity that you give us to look at your word, to study your word, to watch the things that you do and how you care about us. Father, I pray over each and every one that's here in the parking lot, each and every one watching by internet and each and every one watching by television, that, Father, that you'll make yourself real to each one of us in a new way this week. That, Father, we'll have such a great testimony about how things change this week. Father, we love you, we appreciate you, and we thank you for all that you do. In the mighty name of Jesus and by his blood, amen. amen. Hey, remember, Jesus loves you, we love you, and Jesus is Lord. Well, as you've watched the, the broadcast, uh, you need to know that uh, God loves you and cares about you. I hope today that as you listen to this, 
you'll see that his plan for you is to succeed in everything that you do. Anytime we look at the Word, we realize that the Word, uh, when it, it comes alive inside of us, that we begin to get what it says. As we get what it says in us, then we become victors in life. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, today I hope that you'll make that change. Paul said this, he said that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we'll be saved. For with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the heart one believes unto righteousness. And what that means to you is all you do is you say, Jesus is the Lord of my life. I believe that God raised him from the dead. Now that can't be just something you say with your mouth. You have to, you have to believe it in your heart. You have to know that God loves you and cares about you. Because that's the truth. That'll make your eternal destination heaven. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That life was Zoe means the God kind of life. And I want you to have that today. I want you to know that that will cause you to rise to a new level. For those of you that are believers that have been watching this, uh, for any of you, and if you made a change today, make sure you write to us on that uh, address and website that you're going to see in just a minute so that we can send you some stuff. We're excited that God came alive inside of you. If you're believers and or somebody that wants to give tithes and offerings today, there's a button right there on that website that says tithes and offerings. Uh, one of the websites, if you're on it, it says donate. Just push that button. It gives you the opportunity to give to the ministry realizing that you're putting good uh, seed in good soil that is plowed, is fertilized, and watered, and I expect you'll receive a crop. I want to pray over you right now. Father, I thank you for those that made a decision today to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Father, for those that give, I ask you to give back to them, pressed down, shaken together, and running over to make room for more. And Father, we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus, and by his blood, amen. Remember, Jesus loves you, we love you, and Jesus is Lord.